Hi, this is Dr. Sue Cooper with a lecture video for Accounting 752 at Towson University. In this video, we're going to be looking at page two of the lecture notes from chapter 12. At the end of the last video, uh, I was talking about the different kinds of access controls. On the next page, we're going to detail definitions for each of those individual <clears throat> kinds of access controls. Now remember, we're talking about limiting access to the um, private and confidential information that we have in our company. So the first uh, control is called information rights management. And this is something that you would do inside the software or perhaps even purchase separate software package just for managing passwords and access to different parts of the computer system. And it will give some people access to do some things and not other things, and then to see some things and not other things. Think when you're sharing a file from your OneDrive, whether it, it'll ask you whether you want to give the person you're sharing it with the um, access to view the file or access to view and edit the file. Sometimes you can even limit their ability to download the file. That is all part of information rights management. And <clears throat> making sure that when someone is accessing something that is stored on your network or your computer system, that they actually have access and they should have access and they need access to that information. It is the more people that have access to information, the riskier it is and the more likely it is that you're going to have some kind of information loss. The next one is the data loss prevention software. And uh, this is the definition from the book. It works like an antivirus program in reverse. It blocks outgoing messages whether email, uh, instant message, or other means that contain keywords or phrases associated with the intellectual property or other sensitive data the organization wants to protect. So for example, if I, and uh, Towson uses some data loss prevention software on its email. So for example, if I wanted to send an email with a social security number in it, and it was formatted with three numbers, dash two numbers, dash four numbers, the system would catch that and flag it as a key word or a key format for social security numbers. And it could potentially block me from sending that email out because they think that I'm going to be sharing some social security numbers. And that is not going to be in the best interest of the company, whether or not I legitimately need to be sending that information. Uh, there's other kinds of things that can be blocked from sending out. Um, if it, you have like a an actual keyword for uh, maybe a secret project that your company is working on and you don't want anyone talking about it outside the company, you can screen all the outgoing emails and messages to see if anyone is using that keyword and then you can block him from sending it outside the company. Obviously there are ways around it, but this is just a control. It's one of the things that helps prevent losses. A digital watermark is like uh, an embedded code into the file to um, document who the ownership is and who created it and when it was created. Sometimes you will hear people talk about the metadata on photographs and that's like a digital watermark. It's the same kind of thing where you can actually go into the information on the file and find out um, more about uh, where the file came from. So if you find um, the, of your own secret information, out on the internet or in the hands of someone who's not supposed to have it, you can look at the watermark to find out where it came from and where they got it. And that will help you trace down the perpetrators of you know, information theft. This is what we call a detective control. It's something that you put in place in order to detect a problem after it's already happened. So to catch it afterward. Um, to come in after the crime has happened or after the loss has happened to try to figure out who did what. These first two, the information rights management and the DLP software, these two are what we call preventative controls because they are in place to try to prevent someone from doing something they're not supposed to be doing um, and, if, and hopefully to stop them. So you could kind of imagine like a locked door as a preventative control because it's trying to stop you from getting in but if you get in anyway and commit the crime, a detective control would be, you know, looking for fingerprints, trying to figure out who did it and what they did when they were there. 
All right, the last two are data masking and tokenization. These two go together. I kind of talked about this already. Um, data masking will let you see different parts of a system, but will block out stuff that you shouldn't be able to see um, even though you have access to that part of the computer system. So it's kind of like redacting. And you might've heard that term before where the data that needs to stay private is blacked out. Or uh, in the case of the social security number example I used in the last video, when I look up your student file, if I were to look up your student file, I would see a field that says social security number, but it won't show me any numbers. All the numbers in every social security number are replaced with X's. And uh, so that replacement character we call the token. So they've tokenized all the social security numbers. When a faculty member goes in to look at a student's data, we're not able to see any social security numbers because they've all been tokenized and changed. All the numbers have been changed into X's. All right, so let's move on now to regulations. And I talked a little bit about regulations in the United States versus the EU. So we're gonna learn some of the, the names of these. Oh. This is the second learning objective from the book. It says, discuss how the generally accepted privacy principles provides guidance in developing a comprehensive approach to protecting privacy that satisfies the requirements of privacy regulations, such as the EU general data privacy regulation. This is called the GDPR, the general data privacy regulation in the EU. Now notice this, generally accepted privacy principles, initials gap, which I think they did on purpose, but is ridiculous because financial accounting standards are also GAP. We just have two A's, generally accepted accounting principles. So if there's two A's, they're talking about financial accounting. If there's two P's, they're talking about the privacy practices, which feels intentionally confusing. And I'm so sorry. So in this chapter, when we say GAP, we're talking about generally accepted privacy principles not the generally accepted accounting principles where there's two A's. Uh, and then uh, those are the US regulations, the GAPP. And then again, the EU regulations are the GDPR, which are the generally, um, oh, general data privacy regulation. Okay, so here's looks kind of an overview of the GDPR rules. They have huge fines and um, they're related to a lot of, data collection and data storage and data destruction policies and procedures that are required in the EU. Uh, one of the major differences between the EU and the US is the opt-in versus opt-out consent for data collection. And we'll talk about that in the next page. Um, but there, if you are to violate these privacy protection policies in the EU, it will cost you. There will be large fines and they have much stricter guidelines in under those policies than we have under GAP in the United States. Uh, we have the Consumer Protection Privacy Act <clears throat> of California from 2018, that's in the US. We have HIPAA, which is another US policy that has to do with health information. Um, it's very popular for people, conspiracy theorists to talk about HIPAA violations on the internet. Really, it's not as broad as sometimes people think it is. Basically, HIPAA is put in place so that someone can't just call your doctor and ask questions about your medical history. And um, there's obviously it's more technical than that, but that's the main idea. Um, and then the Health Information Technology and the Financial Services Modernization Act, talking about computer storage and electronic storage of information. I was looking through the Becker assignment and I didn't put any of these questions on your Becker assignment for this chapter, but there were quite a few questions on HIPAA. Um, we don't cover it very much in this chapter, but it seems like it might be something that's tested more heavily on the CPA exam. So for this chapter 12, we've got the reading assignment and then a Becker assignment as well. Um, most of the Becker questions are covered very well in the chapter, so I haven't included any additional or extra Becker um text or anything like that. I don't want to run into issues with copyright problems. I, I know I shared that one chapter with you for the last, of the, one section of the Becker manual with you for the last chapter, but I want to try to avoid that as much as possible. So when you're finished with the lectures and the notes, please go 
do the reading assignment and then do the Becker assignment to help you study for that CPA exam that hopefully you'll be taking soon. Okay, that is the end of page two. Next video be page three.